Thank you. Bueno, buenas tardes. Gracias a todos por venir. La presentación ya discutimos que va a ser en español. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just, I wish. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but yes, thank you all for coming. This has been quite a ride, as Nate uh, told it, and I'm very thankful with him and with my committee. I have, I think, the best committee that anyone could ask for in this process. So today I'm going to be talking about indigenous perceptions of environmental change and how local realities and coping str strategies are taking place in the Colombian Amazon. Um, the Amazon, and this is where I would like to take you physically someday, but at least virtually today, is the largest river basin of the world. It covers 40% of South America and discharges over 17% of all the fresh water that goes into the oceans in the world. So it is very important for the global hydrological cycle and, of course, uh, global climate as well. There are areas in the Amazon that have over 2,000 millimeters of rain per year, which uh, explains why this area has been able to remain with forest cover despite drops of temperature that led to savannas in other regions and became thus um, like a refuge for biodiversity, which explains the large amount of endemisms and that this small place of the planet holds over 10% of the world's species. Related to this biodiversity is also an amazing cultural diversity, since in this area we can find over 50 languages uh, that relate to the different ways of, of knowing their environment. The Amazon has been widely recognized as a product of human activity. It's not this pristine ideal that people usually think about when they think of the Amazon. It has been transformed, cut and everything, and population was very large before the arrival of the Spaniards and it's actually increasing again. Oh, sorry. The main threats that this area faces, of course, are overexploitation, deforestation, climate change, um, an increase in human population and all this relates as well to the views that the governments of the six different countries that are founding there have about development for the area. My story is a little bit here. I am working and I have been working and this dissertation was done with indigenous communities of a place called Puerto Nariño, Amazonas. I've been working with them for over 14 years and I just wanted to show some pictures that show the transformation of some of these children that are now adults here with me and <laughs> pregnant with Emiliana <laughs> and then with Emiliana in the field a couple of times and it's a part of my life, the Amazon. So. I guess that explains a little why I'm so passionate about my research as well. Puerto Nariño, my field site, is located 87 kilometers from Leticia, which is, I sorry, um, no. So I have to point with my fingers because this thing doesn't work here. <laughs> Leticia is the capital city of the Amazon in Colombia and the main municipality. The second mun municipality there is Puerto Nariño, which is a city that is located upstream from on the Amazon River, 87 kilometer. Um, it overlaps with the Amacayacu National Park, which is the largest protected area in the region. Very important for conservation. But something remarkable happens here, and is that Puerto Nariño is indigenous territory. It's a resguardo. In Colombia, the 1991 constitu constitution recognized resguardos to be managed independently. They can do whatever they want within their, their resguardo with natural resources, and hence the importance of it overlapping with the Amacayacu um, National Park. The total population of Puerto Nariño is over 7,000 people, but in my field site, and this is Puerto Nariño is like this big, I mean, I'm just showing the the urban, like the capital, I don't know how to call it, but like the urban part. So in the urban part, it's only 1900 people. Annual activities depend on seasonality, basically on the river levels that can vary between 5 and 15 meters in the area. And livelihoods are based on hunting, gathering, fishing, and agriculture is uh, an important activity here as well. The main indigenous groups are Ticunas, Cocamas, and Yaguas in this region, and that's why the resguardo is called Ticoya. So, 
as I said, there is uh, the human relationships with the environment depend on seasonality, and these have to do with precipitation, of course, winds and river levels mainly, temperature oscillations are, we're going to talk about it a little bit more uh, further ahead. Temperature, average temperature is 26 degrees Celsius with a rainfall that is above the 3100 millimeters. The rainy season is between October and June, so we have a very short dry period that is from July to September. And the landscapes are very dynamic. And when I say this, it's not just because the river changes very much, and that makes them, of course, dynamic, but because from year to year, it's very hard to know what the lowlands will look like because of erosion and other things. And in high waters, there are no distinctions between lakes or main channels or forests because it's just this huge amount of water that you can see. And people have become ad adapted to this and survival depends on them knowing how this environment behaves and how they can read it to plan their livelihoods ahead. So for this reason, and given the history I already told you, people have told me or told me in 2010 when I visited there with my husband that they were noticing certain changes, that things were kind of crazy with the environment and that they really didn't know what to do. So that's how my question came up. I want to explore how perceptions and livelihoods are being affected by environmental change and what people are doing to cope with those, with those changes. I am doing that through three questions. The first question has to do with the most important variable for their livelihoods, which is river levels. So I want to see, and I'm sorry, I'm going to come to this area because I have water. Uh, I want to see if the river behavior has changed overall on, or if it has remained the same. Understanding that there is a big chunk <laughs> of variability in the area. On the second questions, I want to understand how local perceptions um, compare with what data tells us, data gathered by the Colombian government in the area. And on the third question, I would like to see or to show you how livelihoods are being affected by dispersive changes and what people are, people are trying to do to cope with them. So first I'm going to talk about Barceas. Barceas are periodically flooded areas. These are forests in theory, but with time they have become occupied, of course, by humans as well. They exhibit this seasonality and have a lot of endemic animals and plant species related to them. And this is because the vegetation that can be found there is influenced by, the, by these floodings. They have to have these special adaptations that allow them to survive um, anoxic conditions and that have very strong roots so that when the water levels rise, they can hold there. Um, they are critical for maintaining water quality and biological diversity as well. And they are, these are areas that are widely used for agriculture. Um, and I will explain the reason for this in a moment. Agriculture takes place in the farming fields or chagras. So every time you hear the word chagras, I'm saying farming field. Um, and the people call them chagras, so that's why I want to make you um, familiar with the term. It takes place both in the highlands, which are the areas above the floodplain, and in the lowlands or varseas that I just described. Uh, the Barceas are recognized for being very rich. Soils in the Amazon are usually very poor, but in the Barceas, this is different because the periodic flooding with white waters that has a lot of sediments makes them very rich and they get replenished yearly. While in the highlands, uh, crops need to, to, or the land needs to rest after a certain period because the nutrients just become depleted. So um, agriculture in the Barceas is adapted to water levels. People need to be able to read and understand when the river is going down so that they can run, plant their crops, and hopefully they'll be ready to, to harvest before the water rises again. So the location and the duration of the flooding determines the areas they use, but also the kind of crops they are able to plant there because of the short time they have. And that's why they have the need to track the river behavior uh, as a very important part of their livelihoods. Water resources, the Amazon is, and I like that because 
a way of describing it in Colombia, it's like an amphibious. That's what we need to understand. These are amphibious communities. Water is a part of their lives. So water resources are crucial for their livelihoods. Fish are more abundant and sort of more predictable than game. Game has become scarce due to several reasons. So it has become the preferred source of protein for the local communities. Um, however, with the river levels and the changes in the landscape, the distribution of fish and the um, availability of fish changes. So for example, they have developed different fishing techniques and they know the different areas where they need to use with the different techniques so that they're able to procure fishing. In low waters, it's much easier for them to procure fish because the fish are like concentrated in smaller amounts of water, while in high waters, they disperse. So what people usually do is they get into the flooded forests where there are fruits that fish feed on and just try to fish around like these areas. Water is also, we don't have in Puerto Nariño, um, Aqueducto? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we don't have that. So what they do is they use the water from the river and the lakes without treatment in many cases. And they just uh, use it for cooking, for cleaning purposes, for everything. That's the water they use. They also harvest some rainwater sometimes, but that's not very common. And a very important source that the, that the water resources or the water itself has there is transportation. The only way, and I forgot to tell you this, to get to Puerto Nariño and all the smaller communities around is through the river. There are no roads. The only airport is in Leticia, which is, as I told you, 87 kilometers away. So the only way you can get to the communities is through the river, but more importantly, the only way the communities can get to Western education or healthcare systems is also through the river. The local environmental conditions in Puerto Nariño, I'm sorry, were described by the informants. And I'm just bringing this slide before telling you about the methods and everything, because I think it's important that you get an idea of what to expect and what people are expecting as we go along uh, this dissertation or this presentation. So this, this is actual data. And these are the average um, river levels taken from a local station in the Amazon throughout an entire hydrological year. This is beginning October 1st and finishing uh, September 30th, which, which is the hydrological year. And you can see here, that is very interesting, that what the graph is showing us actually coincides highly with what people told us, with the descriptions. So first, we do have a good idea that they are very aware of their landscape and they really know how it behaves. They describe how the highest um, peaks are in May, how the lowest are in September, how there are these repiquetes, as they call them, or sudden minor floods in this period of time as well. And you can actually see them in the graphs, which is very interesting. And how when the, like, the river is supposed to start going down in June, so that they can start planting their crops um, in June as well. And that even on low waters, they said there was always water. These are like the normal conditions. This is not related to the changes they've been noticing. This is just how things are supposed to, to work. And there is a very important event that occurs in the region that is called friaje. The friajes are incursions of polar air that occur during the austral summer. And basically, winter, sorry. And basically, these are these cold spells that really lower the temperature. So we are talking about an average temperature of around 26 degrees Celsius that can get as low as 14 degrees Celsius in some times of the year. And they used to occur at least once or twice a year, and it was almost a whole week of, of friaje. And another common description they said was that the seasons were very distinct. So dry season was dry season. There was no rain during dry season. When we talk about verano or summer here, we're talking about no rain. And winter, of course, is rain. These are some images from Google Earth that um, I just I found and I thought were very interesting. And we can see Puerto Nariño is actually here. I know it says here, but it's here. This is, I, huh, this is touch screen. Wow, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it was a discovery. <laughs> so Puerto Nariño is here and not here, it's up here. And um, 
what I find very interesting is that they were taken at different periods of time. So you can actually see how the landscape transforms with the differences in water. For example, that one in August is when the river reaches its lowest level and you can see the islands have emerged and that's where they crop and they plant their things and everything. Well, this one in March of this year, you can see it's just water everywhere. So it's a very interesting slide uh, to really understand like the, the magnitude of the changes that they have to, or that they've become adapted to. With the data that we did the previous graph, we found that the lowest levels reported were of 24 centimeters in a very, very dry year that occurred in 2010. And the highest river levels were in the worst recent flood that occurred in 2012 uh, of 14.15 meters. So we are talking about a, a variation of f almost 14 meters between dry seasons and or dry high waters and low waters. Um, one common thing that they also said, and I just co quote, uh, copied the quote here, was that there used to be a big island across town. So here there used to be a, a bigger island. And that's where they used to cu cultivate some of their crops, but that, that has disappeared. About the winter that I was just telling you about on, in 2012, they said that that was very large. The, one, the winter of this year, it covered all the seeds we had saved in the Chagras manual cuttings. In that time it covered everything and then because of that it is currently scarce. The manioc was completely lost and now there is very little. Sometimes the floods arrive very early. So you have to be patient with my quotations because their Spanish is not great, my English is not great. Put those two together. I know this is not a great translation so okay. So the questions for this fir first part where we want to explore what's happening with the river, basically, which is what determines their subsistence and their activities throughout the years, um, is if there are changes in the trends for the maximum and minimum levels, if there are changes in the durations of floods and droughts, and if there are changes in the, in the timing of year, like seasonal changes that uh, can be seen throughout the, the, the data. We used Nazareth's data, and it was daily river data, from 1988 to 2013. We used that data, okay, so Leticia, Nazaret, Puerto Nariño. We used that data for several reasons. The first one is <coughs> it was the only data that had a fair amount of information with very little gaps, which is very important, because in some other areas they decided not to take the low levels. The other reason was um, it correlated highly with both Leticia and Puerto Nariño, very highly, like above 0.88. I'm trying to find the exact number in case you want it, but um, above, yeah, it's 0.95 with Leticia and 0.93 were the Pearson's correlations of the data. So it shows us a good, it, it, it has a, like, we can have a good idea of what is happening with the landscape using this data that is way more reliable than the available data for Puerto Nariño or for Leticia. So in the first question, we did a time series analysis and used a man kendall um, test to try to determine the direction of trends, if there were any, and the signif signif significance of these trends. We did find, oh, we had to account, of course, for seasonality, because as you saw, the river is crazy. Um, and we did find a positive trend, very significant, that says that regardless of the season, so this is even true in low waters, the river levels have increasing, have become larger or ha it has tended to increase uh, over time, over the last 25 years. Then uh, what we did to try to determine the duration of floods and droughts was dividing the entire data set into quartiles. And then we counted the days in the first quartile and the days in the fourth quartile. So the first quartile would be drought, the fourth quartile would be floods. And that, that way we could compare through the years if these numbers, number of days have changed. So if the number of flooded days has increased or decreased, if the number of drought days has increased or decreased as well. And uh, we also uh, compared just the data on the lowest quartile with itself to see if the droughts have become stronger or just they have or they haven't. We didn't find any significance in any of this analysis with the man candle analysis again for trends and significance. Uh, but what we did find was 
like there was a trend this wasn't just very significant mm -hmm. with uh with the the amount or the yeah the length of the floods so the amount of days in the fourth quartile appeared to be getting longer so kind of makes sense because if floods are getting higher you would expect that it would take them longer to the, wa the water to get down. Finally, uh, when we were talking about the time of year when the maximum and minimum levels were reached, we just basically took the day of the year where the highest peak was uh, arrived, or yeah, the water arrived to its highest peak, and we did the same to the lowest. We did a regression analysis to understand if there was if there was a difference between um, these days, and there wasn't, or no, there is no s s evidence to support significant changes in the timing. So water levels have increased. This is something that we were able to conclude in these uh, 25 years of, of extreme floods. This is important because this can eventually correlate with longer floods. Even though we still don't have the significance, we did so see the trend, and if things continue to be like this, it is very likely that this will happen, which would affect, of course, riparian vegetation because the current adaptations that we spoke about a moment ago to anoxic conditions and everything might not be enough. The, it will have effects on the, global, on the local climate change because um, the water cycles are very influent through evapotranspiration and everything of the local climate. It can reduce the duration and magnitude of the dry periods, which are very important, especially in this area, because we have a lot of um, diseases that are transmitted by uh, waterborne vectors. So this is a period of time where these diseases are kind of naturally controlled. Um, and of course, erosion, that is something that people are noticing already, and sediment transport will be affected. This is something that an author that I quoted in my dissertation said, it is impossible to study the effects of climate change in isolation from the effects of land use change and direct human use of freshwater resources. Humans are an interactive component of aquatic ecosystems responding to changes in freshwater resources and thereby causing further change, which leads us to the perceptions. So what are people noticing? What are people seeing in these areas? And are they crazy or do these relate to, to what uh, data are showing us? All this year, there hasn't been a real summer like in the past. Like from May on, you wouldn't see any rain. And now it is after May and it is constantly raining. It is raining daily and August will arrive. August in the 60s was only sun and people used it to take down trees and burn to be able to plant and now they can't. This was a male, 61 years of age. Um, so my questions for this second part have to do with characterizing these local perceptions and comparing them with uh, the hydroclimatological data. And what are people actually perceiving? That's the first question we want to, to answer. What are the trends for these perceptions from the local data? And then do perceptions agree with these trends, with these observed trends? So we did semi-structured interviews, resource walks, and life histories. They were all carried out in Spanish. That's why I wanted to do this presentation in Spanish mm -hmm. as well. Um, in Puerto Nariño. They were both done in two, three-month periods. One was in the summer of 2012 and the other in the summer of 2013 with 50 people, 25 male and 25 female from 12 to 67 years of age. Uh, they all identified as themselves as indigenous. These are some of them, not all of them, but some of them. I just wanted you to see the faces. Um, and we used an inductive approach to do some content analysis and then with substantive coding, uh, being able to, to identify the trends and the main topics that arose in those interviews. That's for the qualitative part, for the first question. Then for the second question, we used the data from the gauge in Leticia. Um, why we did that is because basically local data is very limited. And Leticia has the longest data time span, the only gauge, because all on the other places, on the other stations, what people do is basically they ask someone to take the temperature or measure the rainfall. And that has resulted in very real or non reliable. <laughs> information might be, and with a lot of gaps. So we decided to go with Leticia for that reason. 
we took average temperature from 1978 to 2014, which is what was available, and total precipitation or rainfall daily, both of these were daily uh, data from the 70 to 2013. So with the first question, when we asked them to tell us what are they noticing, what is changing, what are they seeing, what basically they all mentioned was the changes in river behavior. They all said this is because this is what has the greatest impact on our livelihood. So this is what we are actually seeing. Then they talked about temperature, rain seasonality, which is the quotation I read before, and friaje the cold spells we've, we've discussed or I've, I've told you about. We decided to just compare the data for these four main variables, so be river behavior, average temperature, rain seasonality and friaje with the local data obtained from the gauge and from the river data. So what environmental changes are people perceiving regarding rivers? First, the, flood, the floods are more extreme. They are sudden, they occur suddenly, then they said that the river is actually drying more than usual, sorry, it's out of synchrony and the flow is stronger. With the data we had available, we, this is the first part of the presentation that I already discussed, so this is like the summary of the previous results. Uh, we basically found that perceptions do agree with more extreme flooding, but we don't have the required data to be able to support any of the other perceptions at this point. With temperature, we did a time series analysis of the temperature I already mentioned, and uh, it was very interesting because 80% of informants, and you have to remember, this is a semi-structured interview, so I wasn't guiding them, I wasn't telling them, what are you feeling regarding temperature? I just, I just made the open question of, are you noticing any environmental changes? And without any guidance, 80% of that, of them still said that they feel it's getting hotter, the sun is harsher, it's stronger, it's burning, there's extreme heat. So we decided to analyze both daily average temperatures for the gauge and also maximum temp temperatures, which were um, available as well. In both cases, there is a significant increase. And in both cases, um, the trend seems pretty obvious, even more in the maximum temperatures. Do perceptions agree with observed data? Yes. In friaje. So, to determine a friaje event, this was a discussion, and uh, I actually uh, talked this with the experts. Um, it was a little difficult because the standard deviation of average temperatures in Leticia is up about 1.3 um, degrees. So that makes it very hard to be able to identify like everything that fell below two standards deviation would basically be a very large amount and not really reflectant of these cold spells that I was telling you about. So we decided to stick to three standard deviations. And with that method, it was very interesting because we were able to, to identify the main um, friaje events. The environmental changes that people are noticing regarding friaje have to do with the number of occurrences, so they're saying they're not happening, or they are arriving late. They shouldn't be arriving at the time. Why is friaje important? Because friaje used to be like the seasonal cue they used to know when the summer arrived and that they would be able to burn their fields and start planting in the lowlands. So that's why friaje is such an important thing for them as well. Um, we did some regression analysis trying to compare first the number of events in time and second the time of arrival of this event and what we found was that of these 108 friaje events identified most of them <laughs> took place in the past so yes in a significant manner the number of friaje events are diminishing which kind of makes sense if the temperature is increasing and then uh, we didn't find enough evidence to support the perception of changing seasonality because most of the events from the beginning ha have taken place in July and the few events that still take place are in July. So maybe this perception in seasonality has more to do with the fact that they're disappearing and not necessarily with the fact that time um, has changed. So perceptions do agree in, the, in terms of number of occurrences um, and we don't have enough information to support 
the change of seasonality perception. Seasonal precipitation was a big challenge and we weren't big just summarizing, able to do it. Because <laughs> what we wanted to see was if in, during the summer, the amount of rain or the number of rainy days had increased, which is what they were perceiving, right? The problem was that uh, precipitation in the Amazon is very local. This is because of the Andes. It causes very local precipitation and variation is very, very high. So it is impossible to compare precipitation from the gauge in the Ticia to precipitation in Puerto Nariño. And with the very, very few data we had, we tried, we ran a correlation and it was terrible. So we didn't do it. Okay, so as expected, given the, the um, population we're talking about and their livelihoods and culture and everything, perceptions do agree with main climate trends, especially with higher river levels, temperatures increases, and reductions in friaje events. As I mentioned just a second ago, precipitation, we really, I can't say if they're right or wrong, or there's not information to be able to, to come to a conclusion with that. Um, what there is enough information to come to a conclusion is that Colombia has very limited data. And that is very important because local data is or are what allows us to, to um, track the climatic conditions and understand how the local effects of global trends are being actually um, felt. And this has an important connotation, all these changes. Besides, of course, their livelihoods, affectations and everything, elders and local experts are losing credibility because that's, those were the ones who had the knowledge and who knew when to farm or when to harvest and everything. And with these changes, they are losing it. They can't really rely on that traditional knowledge anymore. So um, with that in mind, we have to understand that this has an important implication on people livelihoods. As one informant reported, heat affects a lot because they have to get very, very early in the morning until 10 a.m., 10 a.m. tops, to work in the chakras. After that, it is not possible because of the sun. Before, they could work all day. Now, people have chagras in the highlands and the lowlands. They don't abandon the one in the lowlands, but have an alternative in the highlands. Besides, it is a very deep tradition of the elders, because water is the Ticuna people routine. So the questions for this third part. <coughs> Sorry. Um, we would like, uh, I wa we wanted to characterize the implications of, of on livelihoods of these perceived changes and what were the coping strategies, right? So the first question we needed to ask why was, like to confirm, why do people pre prefer to farm in the lowlands and not in the highlands or why do they do both? The second is if there are any other issues because we can't see this and this is part of the integrative approach. We can see this in a vacuum. So are there any other issues that are affecting your livelihoods besides these environmental changes? Um, then we did jump to the environmental changes and ask them, how are these perceived changes impacting you or the people you know? And what are you doing to deal with these impacts? So agriculture in the lowlands versus in the highlands. In the highlands, oh, I was going to read it in Spanish. The first harvest is good, but the next is not. So people prefer to cultivate the lowlands. This basically, this quote basically summarizes what they feel. We, ha we, we saw that land fertility in the lowlands was way higher and it was not an issue. <coughs> that crop pests and diseases were higher in the highlands as well. That theft risk is higher because the chagras are more scattered. So there is like no social control of who's taking what on of the fields. Uh, the importance of river predictability is important, of course, in the lowlands, the same as flood lengths, not as much in the highlands. But the rain seasonality is very important in both because it's what allows them to burn their fields. And especially in the highlands, without this thorough burn, all the, all the local pests and infestations get out of hand in, in their crops. And they do have the possibility of work year round in the highlands. This picture shows, and I'm not even gonna try to read it because it's hard even for me in Spanish, uh, but it shows like the only safety measure they can take when people, or for preventing people from stealing in their fields, which is casting a spell. <laughs> um, so non-climatic stressors that are affecting 
<coughs> local livelihood. And this is, this is said by them. This is not something that I asked them or guided them through the answers. The main thing that everyone recognizes, especially adults, and of course my interview was based mainly with adults, is the cultural change. Because it is what used to regulate the relationship they had with nature. And this is due to three main things. The first one is the Western education system, which basically means that they don't have the time to do other things that would allow them to learn their own traditional livelihoods. The second one is interest, just youth is no longer interested, they're no longer interested in, in, in learning like their traditions and practices. And finally, market economies play a significant role as well in this cultural change and how people are approaching nature. Then another important one was overfishing that results from overexploitation. It has become even more a commercial activity with time, even for indigenous communities, not just for colonos, um, as a result of the tourist industry that is blooming in the area and the use of unsustainable fishing uh, methods. There are other things here as well that they mentioned that you can see. So no one teaches younger generations how to farm or fish and they are embarrassed. There is plenty of land, but nobody wants to farm it. They want to live like the white man. So I am the white man there. <laughs> this is how resources are lost. History is lost, culture is lost. And this is what allows that the environment is cared for. When you forget all that, you care about nothing. When we are talking about the impacts of these perceived environmental changes, I... Wait. How do I get out of here? <laughs> Bear with me two seconds. So I want to show you something about the impacts. Ah, perfect. The main impact that it... Or not the main, one of the important impact it has is on infrastructure. Primero que todo, pues, no más, no más, buenos días, en mi idioma, no más, y cupemos nada más idea, porque a ver, ya está niña, no ha cuidado, no ha dicho todo, que yo más, yo no sé, ahora que yo más, 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 yo Sorry for the subtitles, I'm not that expert. Las inundaciones llegó casi aquí sorpresivamente porque fue una de las más altas de toda la temporada. Fue una de las inundaciones más altas de toda la temporada, la cual pues perjudicó mucho a las familias que viven en la parte baja del municipio, inclusive por la zona, por la parte del Amazonas y de Loreto Yaco, eh, algunas familias. ¿ya? La inundación pues dejó muchos desastres. Eh, arrasó con, la, con los cultivos de, los, de las familias no, no, no tuvieron tiempo ni de hacer las paseras para conservar ahí unos, unos colinos, palos de yuca, etc. eso fue de un momento a otro, eso subió o sea como de un abrir y cerrar de ojos so this is a video that I made so that explains the the delay with the subtitles and everything but what i wanted to show basically was that as you can see the impacts are important especially of the floods their livelihoods have been adapted and their infrastructure was adapted to certain river levels so the fact that the river is flooding more than it used to it's it, it is having an impact on on every aspect of their life it also has an impact on agriculture because it as i said or mentioned before um they actually said that there used to be an island that disappeared because of the highest uh, river levels and the amount of currents that are increasing. And it's also causing a, an impact on health. They reported that drownings have increased as well. Uh, the loss of natural cues and the ability to predict their 
environment has been lost, their planting decisions are, in, are highly impact, impacted by the projected flood levels, but also by the loss of these natural cues and the loss of this seasonality um, in the area. Because longer flooding periods in the lowlands impact the opportunity that they have to actually harvest mature crops. Um, the variations in seed distribution and times of fruit to ribbon that are occurring as a as a result of the differences in temperature as well, or that they report that occur as so the differences in the temperature, has an impact because of the way that um, local communities are um, connected between them. So for example, fish need fruits to ripen at certain time of the year so that they, when they get in the flooded forest, they are able to eat the, the, these fruits and everything. Um, the plants have become more susceptible to plagues and disease, and they are losing work hours, basically, there are times of the day where they can't work outside and they are also losing the work they've done. So, for example, they plant a, a chagra and the river comes and flooded, that's wasted time for them. It's a loss of work hours. With water resources, uh, they're noticing an overall environmental degradation. They say that the amount of diseases has increased, being it the only source of water. The navigation has been greatly impacted because they, they, they do uh, say that the lowest waters, even though our data were not enough to prove that, they do say that the lowest water are drying very much, so some communities are becoming isolated at some times of the year. Um, also the higher water levels makes it harder for them to procure fish, and this was explained before. The extreme low levels cause fish mortality, so this pollutes the water, and there are affectations for other species that would be very cool to to research on in the future, like for example turtles that nest on the on the beaches, and birds and the mammals that lick the mineral leaks or, or salados are also uh, being impacted by these changes. With health, they uh, explained that there have become like new diseases have arrived in the area that they are not used to. There are major outbreaks of vector-borne diseases and waterborne diseases as well, and that the river currents, as I mentioned before, are causing more drownings. The lack of a season definition, especially in, in elders and, and young children, have uh, an important effect, they say, on respiratory diseases, and the heat is causing skin complications, fatigue, and headaches in people. This is explained by their approach, or this quote basically explains what they're doing, and it says, not even traditional medicine can control what is happening, because the diseases are constantly changing as well. So, local perceptions <laughs> have proven to be related to climate trends in general, and livelihood strategies are changing in order to accommodate to these perceived changes. These changes have to do a lot with diversifying livelihoods and accommodating agricultural practices. This is how they are coping to these perceived changes. So basically what they're doing is planting in the highlands. So the ones that only had the chagra in the lowlands are opening chagras in the highlands. And if they had a chagra in the highlands, they sometimes open more than one chagra in the highlands. But they're also opening new chagras in the lowlands just to account for the ones that are lost due to erosion and everything. So we are seeing a pattern here. Um, they are changing work hours, they are not working from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. because it's very hard for them, the heat and the sun. And they are exploring new areas, and by this uh, I mean they are trying to find places where they, for example, didn't fish before, to try to find fish in those areas because the ones that they already know are not working at this point, like they can't really access fish there. Um, there is temporary or permanent migration to the highlands that is resulting or to other places. We can see that they're going sometimes to Leticia, which is the city, even Bogotá, you know, other larger cities in, in Colombia, or very, very frequently, we have to remember. And this is something I forgot to mention <laughs> at the beginning, but it's very important. Puerto Nariño is part of a three frontier. It is in the border with Brazil and Peru. And human mobility there is very high. And it's very interesting because the dynamics are very different. People have family everywhere and they don't really identify as Peruanos or Colombianos necessarily in many cases. So mobility is very high and that is a way they are also trying to cope with these affectations. And another that um, 
became sort of common was the transformation of local livelihood strategies. So instead of being farmers or fishers, they are turning into the tourist industry. So this is, picture is very nice because this is a very, very, very old woman. I'm not even sure if she's still alive. That used, this is the process they used to, to, to use <laughs> to get the clothes they wore. But now they're using it to get um, handcrafts for the tourist industry. And there are also some other livelihood transformations that are not great. They have to do with wood extraction or with animal or, or fauna trade, which is illegal, but it's easy to do in that region. And also, which I didn't put here um, just because of the stigma, but um, drugs. So this has implications for the land using the area. Please remember, I'm talking about the Amazon. And I'm talking about a place where several studies have showed that deforestation can worsen clim local climate change, which can be begin to form like a, um, a snowball or something like that, and create major forest dieback. We are also talking about an area that overlaps with a natural protected area, but where use is allowed, given like the nat national constitution. So we are losing or this is causing an impact, it hasn't been quantified yet, in forests and riparian areas for Chagras and oh, one livelihood um, alternative that I forgot to mention and that I really, is that they're starting to bring livestock to the region. So they are losing this or transforming these landscapes either for Chagras, which is not, but also into big pastures for livestock. Um, this has an impact on wildlife as well, because wildlife, of course, depends on habitat and habitat transformation has um, an effect on, on the availability and the distribution of other species on the local climate, as I explained uh, just before, and it disrupts water cycle and affects even further precipitation regimes. So this illegal wood explo exploitation, this more intensive farming, this, this, these activities are having an impact that hasn't been quantified yet on the landscape. But it's also reducing crop diversity because what people are doing at this point is there are like several things and that's why I wanted to explore these other things and not just the environmental change. But with the short amount of time that they have to crop their, or to plant their crops and harvest them before the river floods them, they are changing into those crops that are able to grow in this limited time. So maybe all the diversity of crops they used to have before is being affected by the environmental change. But this can be done also because the tourist industry is putting more pressure or more demand on some of these crops. So this reduced crop diversity is a result of several, of several local dynamics, but it has an impact as well on local knowledge as well. And with time, and this is not something that is occurring right, right now, it might also lead to the widespread use or uh, further use of, of chemicals. This table is not intended to be read at this point because it has a lot of text. But what I wanted to show basically were the effects of the different perceptions of change and the coping strategies. In yellow, we can see that for most of these perceived changes, there are no coping strategies. So in time, we have to address several topics. We have to address, address farming and land cover. What is happening with these changes in subsistence practices paired with this cultural degradation and loss of local knowledge regarding the, the natural world. We have to understand how or what are the effects of these transformations in livelihood, not only from the landscape uh, perspective, but also from the cultural perspectives. Cultures are dynamic, they change. What are these implications? What, what is this gonna um, look like in the future? There is, as we just previously saw a lack of identified sustainable activities to cope with the perceived changes. And this is something that has to be addressed. The health is being negatively impacted. Deforestation seems to be increasing according to what they are reporting themselves. And as just previously mentioned, we are talking about this crazy place that has these invisible borders where we have three different views of development, three different ideas of of policies, management strategies, adaptation plans, and everything that takes place in this, in this region. Hydrological resources are key, and water management, policy, everything that has to do with this resource, access to drinkable water, has to be addressed in time. 
So when we are talking about conserving human landscapes at the point where we are right now in Puerto Nariño, they hate it if you try to make them more indigenous. That is something they hate, and I'm sorry, they don't like anthropologists because they always <laughs> think that they are trying to, to keep them indigenous. That is something that bothers. We have to understand that this is a matter of knowledge, of dynamics, of transformation, and that knowledge can help that, can help them understand, like, okay, we know that maybe it's not Yakuruna now who's going to punish you if you do this, but this is the impact that this has. Um, what are the differential effects of all these changes? They mentioned that women and elders are being differentially affected by uh, heat, for example, and by the rain, like the respiratory diseases and everything. But there are cultural things like women have to care of the crops and men fish and different things that are going to cause differential impacts on these communities. And this is something we need to start considering as well. And what is the information that is required to actually link these social and natural environments or um, places so that we can create models of land use change? Right now, they're responding by intensifying practices. The impacts can be seen in Amakayaku and on the local climate. And this can result in what literature calls sometimes maladaptive approaches. Um, it is important to do continuous monitoring for the hydroclimatic variables in the region, which is non-existent at this point. And it doesn't necessarily, what happens in the region doesn't necessarily reflect what is being done at the policy levels. So Colombia is doing a lot of adaptation plans. Part of the commitments for the COP21 was that by 2030, the entire country would have an adaptation plan and the entire and like half of the country would have them implemented. But these adaptation plans, and I can say this because I worked in this, are not taken into consideration, these local realities and this local information, and hence are not going to be really useful. So the government needs to address this perception and design this culturally sound management practices together with the communities, not top down, like together with the communities, so that they are, can actually come up with uh, feasible solutions for these uh, things. Um, climate change is the context, and that is something every time someone tells me like, oh, do you have experience working in climate change? Blah, 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 I'm like, it's the context. It's not something that we can ignore. It's not like I have experience working with indigenous communities because I definitely could work with other kind of, 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 of people. This is the context in the region. So that is something that we need to understand and understand what it means on a local level. Because we always talk about the scenarios and in Colombia, the temperature will increase and blah, blah, blah. But how is this affecting people? What are the implications on local livelihoods? So local realities are to be considered to be able to create these sustainable practices. And there needs to be a knowledge exchange. For this, we need an integrative approach, a mixture of qualitative and quantitative approaches that allows us to see the complexity of these places and work within the different scales. Because I've mentioned the policy, I've mentioned a, an area that has different countries involved, the frontiers, the local level. This is something that's reality, that's life. And that's um, what I believe that needs to be done um, in the area. So now I want to mention my funding sources. There they are. <laughs> 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 yes, there they are. I want to really, really thank Nate. Nate, take me by under. <laughs> so Nate, thank you. Todd, you've been amazing. My committee, I couldn't be prouder of my committee. You guys have helped me through the hardest parts of my life. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my field assistants, of course. They were my right hand in the field and very close friends. Tomas, <laughs> Joanna, Evan, Cody, you helped me a lot throughout this process. The staff of Warren Online, I really want to acknowledge them because they've been very helpful. Uh, people in Colombia, my friends here in Athens, Hector, for example. Craig Miller, I'm here because of him, even if he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> my family, they couldn't be here. I only have my husband here with me today. Um, Thank you, Juan. <laughs> so 
yes. Questions? <laughs> Sorry. Drama. Just, just before we Come on. shut the door on the rest of you, and you know, questions for the rest of you. I have a question. First of all, very interesting, and that was, it sounds like an amazing project. Thank um, you. Yeah, yeah. I was curious with, um, you're presenting the local, the local knowledge and then the science knowledge. How are you going to present that to, if you are, to, to other entities in a way that doesn't make people think, oh, okay, well, the local knowledge doesn't line up with the scientific knowledge in these areas. So we're not going to value that. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And it has been a discussion in anthropology for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. Especially because in many cases, um, it's not only about like the knowledge of the environment, but mm -hmm. what the, like, the beliefs they had to regulate um, um, the use they made of that environment. But um, what I basically said is the knowledge they have for what is happening now might not line up as well, but it's absolutely necessary to understand how their livelihoods are impacted. Yeah. And in Colombia, I think we have a very good um, understanding of, 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 of local realities because we are such a crazy diverse country, and I, I'm not talking about nature, like just culturally diverse, that people understand that. We just need the policy level to be able to include it as well. But um, there is like the disposition at least. First of all, great job. Thank you. Keeping with the local knowledge, I was, you presented uh, sort of the summary and trends of what those perceptions were, but I was wondering, could you speak about the variation of those perceptions within the community? Mm -hmm. uh, and if you had any sense that there was a certain type of, or there was a certain type of person or certain, anything that could explain like who maybe had uh, knew more? more realistic Yeah. Yes, definitely. It is very interesting because even, oh, uh, wait, okay. Um, so I did find that there were differences between, but they weren't significant between the age groups because I did uh, classify the interviews by age group. I, um, but there weren't significant differences between the amount of knowledge or the information that they gave. Uh, basically because what I did find is that there is a lot of exchange between parents and grandparents and children. So they all have sort of the same information, at least in the theoretical realm, maybe not in the practical uh, realm. Uh, it was interesting also to find that people uh, would, it depended a lot of on, on the individual, not necessarily like on the age group or the occupation or anything, but it was more of an individual thing because there were, at first I thought that women might not talk as much they did, they talked a lot, like I do. <laughs> the same happened with men, but sometimes elders were quiet, sometimes elders wanted to tell me, like I have interviews that last like three hours, <laughs> because they tell me all, and it's a beautiful interview, because they tell me all their my, my mythology and their, and their beliefs and their like cultural and local explanations to things. So um, I would say, of course, that doing things gives you a much deeper knowledge, and there is a point like around 30 years of age, people like from 32 down, they only fish. That's the only thing they do and they do it on the weekends. But they're trying to find these eight to five jobs and they're trying to get a different livelihood. So the knowledge, the depth of knowledge is different uh, for, from them, for them. But with this dissertation in particular, the topics that I explored were fairly general, like have you noticed this change? And they always had something to say. Like they always had something to say they've noticed, even if it was just the heat. And just because they've heard the elders or someone else saying, it's so hot. You were gonna ask something? Um, it was, is there time for? Yeah, okay. um, yeah, it could be a long question, so maybe just very, <laughs> very brief. Um, you had, thank you for the presentation, it was very interesting. You have this wealth of knowledge about this group of people that you're working with, which you obviously can't go into hours and hours of it here, <laughs> although I sense you would love to. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit more about uh, this group of people. Um, you mentioned they have a native language that's not Spanish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how like long have General characteristics, yeah, yeah. yeah it's very interesting history. because, <laughs> and this was something that I had to be caught on because I wanted to tell you everything. As you said, <laughs> this, this defense would have lasted like three hours if it depended on <laughs> just on me. Um, 
this area in particular, Puerto Nariño, is amazing because it brings together different indigenous groups, which is not very common. Usually they are um, settled in, distant, in, in different places. This one has ticunas, cocamas, yaguas, and also colonos. The majority are ticunas. They, each of them has their own language. However, from, I would say, like people my age, which I'm not telling you my age, but people my age don't speak the language anymore. Like only elders speak the language, like that woman I, I showed you because I thought it was a beautiful thing to see, but that's not common. That's like younger generations know of. It's like when I ask, not you, or you of course, but many of you, if you speak Spanish, that you can give me a few words, but not really. <laughs> it's exactly the same with the ticunas and the cocamas and the yaguas, okay? So they know a few words, and every, uh, but not, they don't like, really have the knowledge of the language. And that is something that is being lost. Um, they have been settled there for, since they, it became like an official settlement in 1961. It became a municipality in the 80s, but people used to live before more scattered on the river margins. And this is part of the stories they told me. They used to live more scattered on the river margins. However, with a major flood that took place in the past as well, they decided to relocate and just kind of got together because it was um, like the way of supporting each other. Uh, they have very interesting cultural or they had very interesting cultural practices uh, they are divided in into clans or within the group uh, animals with feathers and other things and other other things include animals with that don't have feathers but also plants for example or fruits clan and that's the only rule they had for um, marriage they had to like people from Feather clans can't marry people from feather clans, and the same the other way around. So that's how they like prevented endogamy or something. And uh, even I had a clan which can signal how open they are to to this cultural diversity. I was clan vaca, and everyone here would be clan vaca. Yes, white white people are clan vaca, <laughs> um, and they are like very happy to get you to, to receive you and, and take you in their communities and everything. They are in this terrible struggle, which is <coughs> kind of heartbreaking, especially because I have strong personal uh, bonds with many of them, uh, where they arrive to 11th grade or 12th grade here, and they just don't know what to do because they don't want to farm, they don't want to fish, they don't want, that's not what TV is showing them or what the ideal of life is showing them, or what their education prepared them for, but there are really any alternatives for them there. So it's sounds in a lot like our kids here as well. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like my son anyway. <laughs> well, but at least he has alternatives. They, it's not because they, they don't want to, it's just that they don't have them. They're unexistent. Well, I think with that, we should probably move to the next phase, and I certainly thank you all for coming.